Well, come in. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Welcome back to Chaos. Do come and have a seat. I'm just settling down to a pipe and a pint, and uh, this is a this is a very nice. Uh, well, it's a porter rather than a stout, but it's so black it might be a stout brewed by a Hatherwood Brewery. It's called Panther. It's very good. It's not too sweet. Um, anyway, um, I thought it'd be fun to share something with you. Do you remember, well, quite some time ago now, you managed to track me down in, of all places, the the Marion E. Wade Centre uh, up at Wheaton College, ensconced among all the wonderful collections of books and also memorabilia of the Inklings and, and some other authors. And I not only showed you Lewis's desk and Tolkien's desk, but you may remember we, we saw the wardrobe. The wardrobe. I was very tempted to open it and get into it. The Marion Wade Centre produces this really excellent peer-reviewed journal. This is a quite recent copy. I've been going for a long time, and this is volume 38. Um, it's called Seven, because they cover and they collect in that centre um, the works not only of, if you like, the four chief inklings, uh, Lewis and Tolkien and uh, Byfield and Williams, but also three others, Dorothy Sayers, um, G.K. Chesterton, and of course, in a sense, the kind of godfather and grandfather of them all, George MacDonald. I was really pleased to get this one simply because um, one of the first things that fell to my eye was an article on Tolkien as allegory, a study in Smith in Wooten Major, by Graham Shea. Now, Graham was one of my best students in Cambridge, and there's always a particular thrill for a, a professor or a lecturer, a supervisor, when they see their students' work in print and they've written really well. And there's a piece on Coleridge talking and the power of illusion in here, which happens to pick up on quite a lot of and cite um, things I wrote in my book Mariner. So that's another pleasure for any scholar to feel that their scholarship has been helpful to other scholars and is cited. But what I really wanted to share with you today was this little treasure which was on that very visit that you came and found me, pressed into my hand by Marge Mead, who's very much part of the spirit of that place and was there from the beginning. And um, It's called the Marion E. Wade Centre, celebrating 50 years, but it's also called The Space Inside. It's a beautifully produced little pamphlet with a lovely, simple gold elastic and nicely printed. But it is by Lucy Shaw, who's a very considerable poet. Well, she's in her 90s now, and she's still writing, like, like Sheslo Miwash before her. She's writing some of her best poetry in her 90s. But this was written some years ago for the 50th anniversary, and it's a celebration of the a memory of and celebration of the arrival of Lewis's wardrobe at the centre. But in the course of celebrating the arrival of the wardrobe, of course, she suddenly gives you this beautiful conspectus on the work of, of, of Lewis and Tolkien and the other Inklings. And she does some very poetic scene setting, so I thought you might like to hear it. She's a poet, so although it's in prose, it's a kind of prose poetry, really. The Space Inside by Lucy Shaw. There we were. In Dr. Kilby's Blanchard office, late afternoon sun lining the space with light that glances off the glassed in bookshelves and high ceilings. Anticipating together with our honoured sage and mentor, we waited a delivery the wardrobe. Shipped in a crate across the ocean to this place. We remember, even after fifty years, how it arrived heavy with promise and mystery and how our fingers, trembling with curiosity, traced the runes and circles in the dark oak doors. How we, like Lucy, pushed beyond the stiffly opening doors, though there, within the must and incense of old cloth, hung 
no winter furs, nothing but a long great coat. Um, we fingered the dark tweed, investigated its deep pockets, sniffing for perhaps tobacco smoke. Did we discover there some tattered animal skin with its tall? Was it and was it tawny as a lion's pelt, or did we glimpse perhaps a lonely planet floating in its wooden sky? But nothing. No fabled battered hat, no lamp post, and no snow or fawns or beavers. No evidence of magic. Only a dry breath of British air, and an implicit invitation, an entry to the deep pockets of story, myth and scholarship. Thus, it was the stores of riches further up and further in began to open for our investigative minds. It was Lewis who first showed us how our human love may live fourfold, divine love, glory heavy, with Narnia next door, heaven and hell divorced and reunited, miracles multiplying, and human griefs observed. Ongoing, we marvel at his legacy, how widening and shining as the outer east. Does our late storyteller grasp its magnitude, this universe that keeps enlarging long beyond his lift away from mortal life? We wonder, is he grateful that the pictures in his mind continue to expand in stories living on, seen multicoloured in this place at Wheaton's heart? For it is here his narratives live on, cheek by a jowl with all those of all his friends, and now become the stuff of studios, of studies, faith, dialogue and debate, the widening of hearts and minds and souls. And now at fifty years we marvel how in heaven's name it grew, for surely heaven was at work as gifts and gatherings enlarged the space inside, only to flare in more than three dimensions as imagination coloured in the countries of the mind. As Kilby, Dorset, Mitchell, Mead and all the zealous stewards of the work received and catalogued the sheaves of letters, typescripts, furnishings, books, first time in print with parchment coloured pages, narrow British margins and their marginalia, an amplitude of acquisitions opening to fresh worlds of fairy and faith for new sprung generations. The burst of offerings engorge the space inside, as tapestries from the relic, threads of oral history were woven, human gatherings hosted, the space expanded, moved and moved again, until for permanence this place was built for all the added documents as they were garnered and got dusted off. The seeds of inkling's kinship burst into a plenty, harvest of artefacts and letters, indelible images from the pens of six scholar men and one intrepid woman. Quantum physicists talk today of multiverses, but it was within the wardrobe and the wade we intuited them first. In there was the place of the lion, conceived by Williams, Lewis's singular esoteric friend, who introduced to us strange realms of magic, where substitution, coherence and exchange reshaped and kindled past events, and in which Plato, Angelicals and Hell took form and narrative coherence. I have to say, for one little paragraph, that's a brilliant summary of the range of Charles Williams' thought. And Barfield, lecturing at Wheaton, our house guest for half a week, words, meanings, consciousness, his literary treasury rests in there. He left us with a small memento, a dottle of tobacco ash knocked from his pipe into a convenient vase. And for soul friendship, Owen was the ally of all whose thoughtful conversational philosophy dismantled Lewis's atheism. In there, we saw the thrust of Tolkien's conversation arrowing through friendship with Lewis into a contagious faith. In there, J.R.R. spun his mythic history of Middle-earth, its narratives in angular elvish. There he limbed for our imaginations the Shire with its unlikely hobbit heroes, Gandalf, Galadriel, Smaug, Gollum, Orcs and Elves and Ents, Mordor and the Power of the Ring. In there are creatures beatific and horrific. In there still sings the Silmarillion. That's again a brilliant one paragraph evocation of talking. Then she comes on to say as, in there, in Sayers' fecund lines, the maker's mind was diagrammed as Trinity. A rebuilt cathedral became a play, and Peter and Harriet a couple. 
For her, a wartime bomb shelter was the setting to bring Dante up to date in Tetsurima. In there, we read our way into George MacDonald's old soul, his Scottish brogue giving words to the north wind, cold breathing at his back. In there, he turned the golden key, unlocked and liberated the light princess, expounded the wiles of Lilith, dramatised Fantastic's quest and told of Curdy, the princess and the goblins. His sermons were unspoken but well lived, and Lewis told us it was he, the master, who baptised his imagination. So, as I say, invoking them all. Then finally the one on Chesterton. In there we find Chesterton's odd invention, an invisible man. And it was his opinionated Father Brown who searched a moral universe for clues. In there we came to recognise the power of orthodoxy's apologetic, springing from both reason and imagination. We longed to listen to his disputations, his treatises of erudition and irony. And so we can, in there. The evidence is there, real, valued, displayed, available, speaking louder than any of our words about it. All this and more, the fruit of Kilby's welcome, ushering Lewis, Joy and throngs of friends into our ken. Now, as these prophetic messengers live on, such remnants as northernness, conviviality, conviviality and verse, Briarwood pipes, strong ale, and bawdy conversation in an Oxford tavern thrive. Though dead, our heroes of the spirit live today, as their invented mythic worlds in words and images take root in avid minds. Today, in here, we celebrate them, each and all. God bless the Lewis wardrobes, open, wide, inviting all the world to come inside. She can't resist a bit of poetry at the very end. I think that's just beautifully written. And as a sort of evocation of these seven writers is 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 um is unsurpassed really for both kind of poetry and brevity. But I also as a bibliophile, I mean you know, I've shown you great big old volumes, but I really love these kind of uh, what what the catalogers would call ephemera. Ephemera are meant to be just things of the day. But I hope this will be on my shelves and then passed on to someone long after I'm gone and somebody will feel the same joy that I did when I was given it and read Lucy's beautiful little exposition. So um, you came and saw the wardrobe with me that day and I'm just remembering it now and here's to it. God bless. <laughs>